completely the other way. A terrorist will scan, in fact, the crowd and will detect exactly the one who has an American passport. So it works completely the other way around. So I think that there is a, a, an incredible challenge, and this was the, the topic of my talk, is to raise awareness about this, the question to delineate, in fact, the, the, the area, maybe to find a methodology to approach the problems, I think is an emergency. Okay, so this will conclude that we just push to just one announcement will be done, but I just put the site. There has been, in fact, following this discussion, there has been a meeting yesterday, um, the creation of a dynamic coalition on the Internet of Things. Okay, this site is about the proposal, but this, in fact, has been, in fact, uh, uh, agreed upon. And this is the site. And, um, okay, so you can see, by the way, see a RFID a circuit, and you see you have a barcode. Okay, thank you for your attention. Merci. Merci, Francis. Well, it looks like uh, non-technical aspects of the network of things is, are going to be uh, major matters of contention for the next years to come. Maybe that the technology is a little bit too much ahead of the people. Now, I would like first, is there any particular question, Bob, you would like to answer before we answer you would like to give to one of the questions that were posed already? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Francis, thank you for that uh, informative uh, presentation. Obviously, like one of the conclusions that you draw. Um, but uh, I want to come back to Bernard's comments uh, earlier. He, he raised some questions. Um, I happen to think that was a you said were essential. You talked about neutrality, interoperability, and openness. Um, of course, interoperability uh, is what the internet was all about in the first place. So that's uh, clearly something that I, I would support and it's very clear. Openness also is important. I, I would describe it in terms of open architecture because it's what allows interoperability to take place. The ability to have standard defined protocols and interfaces that people can connect to. Um, but it's got a larger political uh, implication as well, and so I just acknowledge both of those. I'm very uncomfortable with the term ne neutrality, um, not because I disagree with what the people who have been discussing it are aiming for, it's just that to me that word is more of a slogan than it is a definitive term. I would much prefer the term transparency, and by that I mean um, most of the issues that have come up, at least in the U.S. in the context of network neutrality, have been about what I would call business issues and business models in the context of a competitive business environment. Um, and frankly, you know, I think it's very healthy when you do have competitive you know, environments in which people can offer different kind of services. The important thing is that individuals have some clear expectation of what the service that they're about to get is all about. Is somebody going to read the material that you put in? Will it be real time? Are there any hidden costs? I mean, all of the things that pertain to that, if the user's expectations are clearly met and not violated during the provision of that service, then it seems to me you've got transparency. And I feel like that's a much better term from my perspective than neutrality, which is more of a, a slogan and has been used to mean whatever the uh, articulator of that wants to, wants to say. So having said that, um, I would come back to the question of how we ensure interoperability and open architecture when at the same time we're trying to get people to invest in innovation within the network environment. And most of that discussion has been about, well, investing at the edges. And I certainly think that's going to be an important thing for people going forward. However, what's been lost in, in the mix has been the possibility of 
investment and innovation in the core as well. Now, certainly the carriers have been supportive of that, and the objection to that is that it offers the possibility that you might fragment the net, because if you build capabilities into the core of one net and they don't exist in the core of another net, then you don't have any uh, necessary guarantees that interoperability will occur. So for that to be allowed and to cause the net not to fragment, namely to maintain interoperability and this open architecture, it seems to me that any such investment has to require the specification of an interface, an open interface standard that other parties can build to those capabilities. If you build them into the core of one net, the user has to understand what the effect of those will be on the services they get and that other people can then interface with that to maintain the interoperability going forward. It's a very deep, a very complex issue and I uh, applaud uh, Bernard for, for packaging it the way he did and articulating it as clearly as he did, but it's a deep and sensitive question and that would be my take on it. Okay, well that's an example of the kind of uh, discussion we could have for a very long time. I've heard that for many years already. Uh, interpretation of words and uh, let's say priorities in uh, uh, development for the future is of course introducing some uh, uh, difficulty in having consensus. Anyway, uh, I'm sure there are more uh, aspects that uh, some of you would like to raise. Is there any particular aspect that has not been properly or clearly um, presented, in your opinion? There is, I see one hand over there. Bob Jolliff from the Shuttleworth Foundation in South Africa. Um, the, the, the last speaker made a very clear distinction between the sort of machine-to-machine -machine network and the human-to-machine -machine network. But I think perhaps failed to broach the third emerging possibility, which is the human-to-human -human network with embedded chips. Is there any comment perhaps people might want to make on that? Yes, that point. yes. Yeah, in fact, it's quite amusing. Uh, well, there is the human, the traditional, I will say, internet is almost, uh, uh, well, machine-to-human. But it's true that uh, through RFID tags or something like that, that some people could connect themselves, recognize themselves, and uh, yes, it's a distinct possibility that in fact could be um, um, advocated. The thing is, as makes this distinction because I, it's very important that human people not be associated with machines. Otherwise, in fact, the... Bob, I think uh, the important question Can of... Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, this is Ram Karan. I represent a company called SIFI. We are one of the largest internet providers in India. Um, the very pertinent aspect of investment in the core and, and the importance of interoperable standards for the next generation internet, uh, I, I think... Uh, um, out of the social concerns that we are seeing in, in, in this forum, there is very, very little uh, clarity on, on the direction or the architecture of the internet itself. Um, is, a, is there a uh, worldview other than naming standards? There is not much discussion, IPv6 and naming, there's not much discussion on the core of the internet itself. Um, can you throw some light on uh, what would be a, a global information infrastructure from um, look like, let's say, five years from now, and how can we shape now, what can be the role of private industry in that? Okay, there's been a lot of discussion about clean slate internet, uh, investments in, in changing things, but uh, I, th I think the closest I've been able to come to something like that is this whole idea of a digital object architecture that lets you manage both the creation and the access to information, putting it together to work. And I think that can be done in a bootstrap fashion on top of the current internet 
That is, you don't need to scrap it and replace it totally in order to build on top of it. In fact, every major innovation in the networking world has been leveraging something that's been there before. Packet networks leverage the least line capabilities of telephone companies, uh, the internet leverage the existing packet network structures, and I think we can do that again today. Most of the arguments for um, reevaluating the internet have been based around um, historically at least flawed arguments in my in my in my view, which doesn't mean that there might not be some lower level uh, architectural principles that we could adopt and, and could be built in. The question you have to ask yourself is, can we adapt the current internet architecture by adding things to it? Do we need to scrap it all and start all over? Uh, three of the arguments that, that have been historically made were that, number one, we don't have adequate security in the current net. Okay, that's a fair question, but I don't believe it's a technical question because we could have generated security in the internet right from day one if the uh, appropriate uh, governmental bodies, you know, had been comfortable with that. We could have, you know, cleared the rights to do that. The, the world was not ready for it at the time this all started, and it's not clear to me that we have consensus around the world as to even how to do that today at the level that companies would like. So that, I think, is a non-technical problem. It's a policy uh, and political problem, political issue, I would say. Second of all, people have complained that, um, you know, we have too much in the way of uh, attacks on the net, viruses and things like that. And to me, that's a, that's a comment about the vulnerabilities in the applications and services that are connected to the net, whether they be operating system, browser issues, I mean, there are certain vulnerabilities at the application level that have to be dealt with, and, and they don't have to do, you know, strictly speaking, with encryption and, and traditional security things. Um, and then finally, people have claimed, well, we clearly need to do something because there's too much spam, for which my argument would be, number one, the network must be doing a really good job because it's getting all that spam delivered. doesn't mean you need a new one. And number two, if you really do have a solution to the spam problem, of which simply charging for sending electronic mail is one possibility, not necessarily one everybody would sign up for, but if there was a solution to the spam problem, tell us about it and we can probably implement it in today's internet itself. So none of those to me are arguments for a clean slate internet. Having said that, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that there would be some really good ideas for what a new architecture would be. I'm almost sure that that will happen at a lower level than the digital object architecture that I've been pursuing. And I would like to see somebody then articulate it as a comprehensive whole architecture that for which you need to scrap the whole in order to get there. Yeah. Now you want to add something? Uh, a, quick, uh, a quick comment about this question. Uh, obviously, uh, and Bob mentioned it, the, uh, the debate, the political debate about um, neutrality, that's the term that has been coined, or, or, or maybe the fact that uh, some says the, the network must be or must stay stupid and uh, uniquely transmit the bits from the edges and not prioritize or not organize or structure those bits. Um, it's um, it's interesting to note, uh, and uh, as an observer, I'm, I'm uh, obliged to note that the three of the main architects of the current internet are currently having radically different views on that question. Uh, Vint Cerf has been saying uh, vocally and uh, many times that he was a, a defender or a proponent of net neutrality. Uh, and on the other hand, we uh, attended a few years ago a, a very interesting debate on that clean slate approach, uh, on the possibility to recreate another net between Vince Herf and Mr. Dave Clark from the MIT. And what was interesting is the fact that uh, at the end of the debate, Dave Clark, who is proposing Genie, which is a, a new network initiative uh, on, especially on sensor networks, 
um, at the end, Mr. Vince Cerf said, we could debate for months about the technical vision behind this project, but basically what we don't know if, is the fact that if we create that, will it open a Pandora's box with a control that is completely different on the network? Let me just say a word about that. Um, the Genie initiative was uh, um, and is still a work in progress and I would be glad that we could have the, the team of uh, Dave Clark to talk about it, but uh, basically creates a new layer for aggregating the content that comes from the sensors. Basically, you were talking about the risks uh, and the, the limits that people are saying, security, uh, and, but the, what the people from the Genie project say is the fact that if we implement those billions of sensors everywhere, the network would not support that kind of load. I'm not an expert. My uh, neighbor could answer about the technical aspect and, and see if the, the, the network as it is, is scalable enough to accept billions of uh, flux of streams of information coming from those uh, sensors everywhere. But basically, Genie says, we need machines in the network that aggregate those content and then transmit refined information, much lighter in terms of uh, uh, volume, to the end user. So those machines are acting like filters. So the question is, if those machines are coded inside the network as essential, then the, the owners of those machines have a power that no one has on the current internet in terms of global filtering and maybe possibly global censorship. So the, the idea is, do we modify the architecture in a way that the transmission is not the key, but processing the information becomes the key? That's the, the issues at the core of the network are about that. Do we allow the network to modify the information? From, from what we see, and I, I, I mean more as a, a political person than a technical person, uh, that is not proved that it's not proven that it, it could add something in terms of innovation. And we French have a special experience about that, about very centralized network. Uh, and uh, like Minitel, and we know especially that it never allowed creation at the edges. And basically, it was a, a, a monitored network, a centralized network that never ever evolved in the way the internet has evolved, creating new services every year or many times a year and having major services becoming like the web, a, a media by itself and allowing the network to reach much more than the scientist, scientific community and becoming the, the largest media ever created. So basically, that's the, this kind of opportunity that we fear to lose in a network that would re-centralize some of its, of, of its function. That's why we have been advocating the defense and the, 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 the protection of those principles, whatever the name we call it, end-to-end, -end, uh, like uh, Andrei Blumenthal has been, has been saying, uh, but basically it's about protecting the innovation capabilities of the network that has been so obvious for the last 10 or 15 years and it's something that we could lose if in terms of security and never underestimate the crisis like the, the Kaminsky crisis on the DNS, never underestimate the fact that the pressure by the security community on the network in the next few years could be so high that it could lead to uh, see the uh, clean slate approaches are valid approaches, which has not been the case for the last five years. Thank you. These are interesting questions, I guess. You know, <clears throat> the dynamic coalition would be a proper uh, location to uh, put uh, any new concept or, or disagreement or suggestions or whatever that you might have. Now, you want to say something, Francis, but it's going to be short. Yes, it will be short. In fact, when you see that the net, about the net neutrality, there is a very concrete engineering approach 
Uh, Cisco recently, I think one year ago, I'm, I'm following this, have opened API to the operating system, which by the way is proprietary. So now it's possible for the ISP, in fact, to program the routers and in fact to, uh, in fact, Firestorm did not uh, uh, say uh, it was not true. In fact, it is. So you can program the routers now to uh, prioritize search and search tra traffic. So the problem is if you want to have the net neutrality, then you have to keep the network dumb. And if you want to keep the network dumb, in fact, you have to sell on routers who cannot allow that. So if you want to prevent, to, to preserve net neutrality, there is a very simple, uh, very simple engineering approach. It's like when you don't want to people to want to, to go to a higher speed limit, then you don't sell Porsche. So I'm a little provocative again. But it is a little the question. So if you leave the, the tools to the people to destroy neutrality, then of course the risk that it will happen is very high. Okay, now a uh, question I would like to ask the audience is uh, after this workshop, are there any specific thing you believe would be very helpful to you, very interesting or very uh, something you might bring home or something you might use in the future, either for your professional job or just to be involved in uh, more discussion on this topic. Question. Who has any, let's say, request or requirement? It would be addressed to the, mainly to the uh, contributors. Thank you, thank This is the URL of the internet. <laughs> okay, I I just wanted to make one comment about um, you know the network itself uh, as to whether it was scalable. I mean, we're actually involved in the Genie project, so I know a little bit about what's going on there. But uh, we we've seen a very significant scaling up of the internet from its early days with 50 kilobit lines to the point where we're dealing with you know gigabit per second capabilities today and you know the combination of uh, equipment and transmission and computing has has kept up at some level I, I, I think today the real bottleneck is more at the computing level than it is at the networking level uh, just in terms of moving data back and forth so I, I don't see what particular bottleneck is going to uh, be an impediment for moving all this data. I mean, maybe just a strict bandwidth limit and the, you figure out how much data is going to have to be collected from all of these sensors or whatever. We just make sure that the net is provisioned properly to handle it. So that's not one I'm particularly worried about, which isn't to say we won't find a bottleneck. I just don't know what it is at this point in time or when it would occur. Uh, as for the the more um, fundamental set of concerns that were raised, I want to come back again to this issue of transparency rather than neutrality. You know, there's a, a joke about, you know, what, what's allowed in certain governmental structures, like you have a structure that's everything that's not explicitly allowed is prohibited, that's one model. You have another one that says everything that's not explicitly prohibited is allowed, that's another model. Uh, we have some where everything that's explicitly prohibited is allowed and others where everything that's expressly allowed is prohibited, but those are four different models. Uh, I don't think we need any of them because um, I think if you have transparency, then people can make choices. And I think that's the essential issue. If you get into capabilities, whether they're in the core or the edge, whether they're prescribed or not prescribed, as long as the end users understand what it is that's happening to their information, and they have some visibility into what happens, they can make choices. You may choose one service that does one set of things, that there's gotta be competition, but somebody else might very well say, I, I'm not willing to abide by that. Well, as long as they understand what it is and there is transparency, they can make a choice of going to something else or doing nothing at all. Those of you who are really interested in pursuing that uh, theme, to somehow get involved in the dynamic coalition on Internet of Things. Thank you very much for this uh, little time we spent together. Have a good time. Bye-bye. <laughs>